It's September 8th. What a great day. 20 years ago, I moved out of home and I'm still playing games. All right, but we have a lot of things to talk about other than my the vassal tradition, of course. But folks, first of all, um, there's still promos left for Sheriff of Nottingham. If you're interested in that and such, you can find us on Dice Tower at, underneath our donate page. But more importantly, there is the Dice Tower Top 100 of all time, or the People's Choice Top 100 of all time. This week, Sam and Z will be finishing up their Top 100, and then the week after that, we'll take a break, we'll do a Top 10 list, Top 10 War Games. Then the week after that, we're going to be doing my Top 100 of all time, and Dan King's Top 100 of all time. We'll be doing those back to back. But somewhere in there, I'm gonna start the People's Choice Top 100, where Sam Z and me take a look at your choices. But for to get your choices, you need to vote on these. So to do that, click on the link underneath the YouTube thing here. I'll put a link for the Top 100. Click there and vote. Now there's a couple things about voting. First of all, I ask you to vote for your favorite 20 games. You may not have 20 games for your favorite. You might just have four or two or one. That's fine. Secondly, you have to register on our website. That's just so that we keep spam bots out. I will never use your email for anything else. Simply just a way for you to register so you can vote on this or other top 10 lists. In fact, you can always go and vote on our current top 10 list at any point in time so that we can have the people's choice for that. Okay, well, that's enough about the Dice Tower. Let's get to the news. Okay, some news. First of all, the uh, Lamont Brothers, Fragor Games, uh, they come out with one game a year at Essen Spiel, and this year the game is going to be Dragon Scroll. Do you know what else I know about the game? Nothing, except it's going to have massively overproduced pieces. And the, this is the only picture I found of a dragon from Board Game Geek. So hopefully we'll find out more information. And I, yeah, I like a lot of their games, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Uwe Rosenberg shows off Fields of Oral. Z-Man Games is picking this one up. And it looks like the same theme as every other one of his games, but lots of tiles and lots of pieces. Here's hoping that's good. Portal has gotten back the rights to Narashima Hex, along with all their other games. So uh, previously, Z-Man had that, and this seems to be an amicable breakup in a sense, but Portal will now be releasing that stuff in English, so if you want to get it, you'll be getting it through them. Victory Point Games has issued an apology for those who've gotten Villainous Vikings. They basically said, we published our game and it was kind of garbagey and we're going to fix it. Not often you hear publishers say that. California Gold has been uh, is announced from Numskull Games. This has to do with building orange groves and takes about two hours. Sounds a little boring, but maybe it's not. One Night Ultimate Werewolf Daybreak. The first expansion for One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Perhaps they will get Eric Summer to do the expansion for that on the app. And let's see, Small World Expansions from Days of Wonder. They've announced a couple things. First, that they have a new expansion, a Spider's Web, along with the previously only people who did the Kickstarter got Royal Bonus. Each of these will add a few um, different things to the, a, a few races to the game. The uh, Ice Queens look a little bit like people with ice cream cones in our head, and they look kind of pleasant. Not so scary, but that's how they lure you in. Always good to see these. Uh, more expansions for that. Also, they're re-releasing previous expansions that they had basically as promo items. The Leaders of Small World and the, the Necromancer. Now, I wouldn't go out of my way to get the Necromancer, but the Leaders was a cool little addition. The success in a lot of games is not letting your opponents know just what it is that you're up to. But let's face it, sometimes you just flat out want to lie to your friends. When that's the case, bluffing games have got you covered. First up, we've got Jacques Zimet's Cockroach Poker, or in the original German, Kakerlaken Poker. In this game, you pick a card from your hand, you pass it to a friend, and you tell them what it is. Or you lie to them. Or you tell them the truth, but make it look like you're lying. Eventually, someone's going to have to make the call and hope that they don't fall for a lie. One player loses, and everybody else wins in this bluffing game of bugs and beasties. Next up is Skull, or as it used to be called, Skull and Roses, by Herve Marley. This game is played almost purely in the heads of the players. It's sort of like the battle of wits between Vicini and the Man in Black, only it supports up to six people and nobody dies of Iocane poisoning. 
Ludovic Moblanc's Cash and Guns, or uh, as we like to call it around here, Reservoir Dogs, the board game. This is by Repost Productions, and this is a great bluffing game where the goal is to get as much money as you can and you threaten people with guns to do it. That sounds like a good time to me. Finally, we've talked about it before, but we're going to talk about it again. This is Coup by Ricky Tata and Indie Board and Card. This is a Kickstarter darling of a game that, again, is all about the bluff. If you've got friends who like poker, get them to play this. I just introduced this to one of my wife's old college poker friends, and she absolutely loved it. Or did she? She did. Maybe I'm lying. Who knows? No, she totally loved it. That's right. No, I'm kidding. She hated it. Or am I? Bluffing games. They're a lot of fun if you like to lie. Hey folks, I wanted to show you um, some of the websites that I think are pretty fantastic. And this is a really cool one here, Tabletop Audio. Now this is a free website, although at the very bottom you can, if you like it, become a patron of the website or donate to it. But what this gives you is kind of background ambience for, uh, for basically a game that you're playing. So let's say you're playing a fantasy game and you want to play this Woodland Campsite. You can just click here to play it. And you can hear kind of this background you can play it quietly so it's there in the background and sometimes there's a little bit of music but there's also a little bit of sound and you can see that there's lots of different things this is a superhero thing and it has a theme but I really like the fact that in here you have different kinds of things maybe I'm playing Android so I want to play Los Vangeles 3030 this gives you that idea of being in the future uh, maybe I'm playing a Western game the thing is, any kind of game that has this really cool feel to it will show you a lot of cool stuff. I, and I'm not playing Western here, I'm playing Deep Space. You can also add them to a playlist, you don't have to keep playing them. Each one is about 10 minutes long, and it will loop if you let it play. This is the Western one. And, and again, this isn't a big deal. Uh, maybe you're looking for specific music, but I really like these. I like the ambience they add. Obviously, this is probably a stronger thing for a role-playing game, but I really enjoy them for uh, gaming. Here's Bubbling Pools. I don't know what game I would use that for, but the desert awaits? Oh, yeah. I'm going to play through the desert to this next time. I guess, or maybe Descent in the Desert. But either way, check out Tabletop Audio. The bombs are guarding and the pistols will blast As you play a game familiar that are so much more than just the knights are leaping In the field it'll bound, fighting for kingdom and fighting for crown You're watching your opponent as he builds his evil So fight for glory and for the trumpets that sound Fighting for kingdom and fighting for crown The maiden beckons here, I'll fight and do your very best For only winners get the chance to see my ample vest So fight for glory as your men are on ground Fighting for kingdom and fighting for crown Fighting for kingdom and fighting for crown Tom Vassell here. Jason Levine. And we have questions, or you have questions, we have answers. Send them to tomvassell at gmail.com. Today's question is from Graham, and he says, is there a market for secondary games? You know, can you go out and hunt down games and sell them to make money? What do you think? Well, I'm someone who I keep all my games, so I don't really sell them. But there is a market for it. It's a tough market. If well, what if someone gave you a game that was valuable and you didn't like it? Would you still keep it? I would give it to someone else. I wouldn't actually sell it. I've never actually sold a game. Really? No, I've never sold a game. Um, but if you were looking to sell games, I don't think trying to buy games and hope that they hold value is a good way to do it. I mean, every once in a while you get something like the, the War of the Ring Collector's Edition, and that 
people bought it for four hundred dollars at the time, and now it goes for over a thousand. But in general, that's the anomaly, though, rather exactly. than the general. In general, you're going to pay more to buy the game than you're going to get in return. The only time that I think you actually can get a profit is when they have those crazy sales at Barnes and Nobles, and people can buy the games for seventy-five percent off, and then they can sell them back to people for a right. But even price. that, you're working really hard. We have a friend of ours who goes around and gets these games, and he sells them for a profit. But he works really hard for a tiny profit. You get to do a better job just. Getting a job. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, like you have, let's say, I don't know, we're going to guess, Jason has 3,000 games, okay? So let's say each game has it worth an average of $20. But we're saying that because some games are card games and so on. So, and that's, this is probably a low estimate. So 3,000 times 20 is $60,000. That's how much he probably paid for them. If he had to sell his collection today, let's say you went into massive debt and you had to sell it all, I don't think you'd get that much. I don't think so either. And the amount of effort it would be, you'd sell them on Board Game Geek, eBay, those, and, or Amazon. Those would be the three places to sell them, or a big garage sale. I think people would come to you looking for deals. Because exactly. board gamers are cheap! Exactly. <laughs> They're always looking for deals. If, if I ever did sell my collection, which I don't think I will, I have a feeling it'll be like the way it happened with Sid Saxon, where there's an auction. At, after I pass away, there'll be a giant auction for all my games, and people will come to buy them in an estate sale auction. I'll be the auctioneer! <laughs> that would be good. All right. Anyway, we'll see. It's interesting. Maybe other people can have different method ideas and stuff. Put those in the comments of this video. See you next time. <laughs>I have so many exciting things. I mean, first of all, we're seeing the top 20 of Sam and Z's top 100 games of all time this week. And so you know there's going to be some good games there, or will there be? Uh, watch those. Those will be produced Wednesday and Friday. But there's lots of other good reviews. I'm looking at the, my review pile, which I'm not showing you because I like them to be a bit of a surprise. But the cool thing is I'm looking at all these reviews, and I'm giving some decent reviews to a couple of them, but the rest I like quite a bit. I'm in a happy mood this week. Uh, well, it's my birthday, so I can afford to be happy. Now, I still have plenty of games over on my other side here that not all of them will be positive, but there's lots of big games that I'm, I'm going to be doing. Okay, I'll tell you one. I'm doing Battle for Five Armies this week. Woo! Okay, some excitement coming, so stay tuned for that. Also, the Dice Tower uh, will be published this week. Uh, we're doing uh, top 10 Milton Bradley games uh, you, and all the other shows on Dice Tower Network. There's a lot of post-Gen Con shows, a lot of, you know, just a lot of good stuff out there. Check all that at DiceTowerNetwork.com. And John Richard has joined us for reviewing, so he's putting out a couple reviews this week. There's some good stuff coming. Check it out. All right, what is next? Ah, Chaz. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here with the next installment in my Meeples for Sheepish People series, discussing the social activity of board games in the lives of people who aren't really socially outgoing. Now last time, I mentioned how the idea of using tiny little pylons at a convention to signal games that are looking for players can make things a lot easier for those who may feel shy about approaching people to play. Well, that's, that's all well and good, but it's still puts you at the mercy of, of needing to have good timing. Oh, but, okay, let me try to make things even easier for you by sharing an embarrassing story. Oh, goody. I usually register for conventions online, and I find that more and more of them are starting to offer registration for events as well. Well, at first I didn't pay any attention to event registration, because I thought by events they meant things like discussion panels, or cosplay costume parades, which they could use the tiny little pylons for. It wasn't until after a fruitless day of trying to find open games at my first convention that I realized that by event, they meant games. The events at the convention were simply people scheduling games ahead of time. By signing up for the events, you were simply reserving a seat at that table for that game at that time. So, if your convention allows you to schedule games as events, take advantage of it! That way, you can have a literal game plan for the convention by pre-planning an itinerary of games that you're going to be playing, taking all of the game chasing out of the picture. Now, in hindsight, it seems embarrassingly obvious. 
But every gamer has to start somewhere, so hopefully my foible will help another shy person avoid the same mistake. Okay, next time. Gauge the strange change in strain when center stage. Hey, today we're talking about gaming components, and I love Marvel Dice Masters. It is a fun game, lots of dice to roll. It's been out of print for a while, but it's coming back in print, and hopefully it becomes big and wonderful so people buy lots of copies so they keep making expansions for it, because I love it. But the bags that came with the game are garbage! Now, I can't show you them because I got rid of them. They're like air sickness bags. But I am showing you a cool component here. These here are some bags, and I'm going to put a link into the uh, bottom of the video where you can see where you can get these bags. They're from Great Lakes Game Emporium. Now, they're reversible bags, so if you want to like hide the fact that you're a geek, I suppose you can turn them inside and be like, oh, I'm just great, that's cool. But come on, I want to show this off here. And the bags will stand on their own when there's stuff inside them, or even when there's not stuff inside them like this. So these are a lot easier to put your dice in. You pull them around, you pull your dice out, and you're feeling very marvelous. These are two of the designs. I like them both. I don't know which one I like better here. This, I like the comic books all over, but this one has like four. And I need one with like Captain America real big. He's my favorite character. But there he is. He's still on here. So I like these bags quite a bit. They have a draw sting too. So you can close them, carry your Dice Master's bag around, ready to attack somebody anywhere. I feel like making an 80s commercial about this. Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. In a game that basically defines Tom's approach to push your luck games, Can't Stop is a Sid Saxon release that still holds up after 35 years. Let's take a quick look at the app version of this classic game. In Can't Stop, you must be the first to get three of your pieces all the way up any of the columns. Roll four dice, pair them up as you choose, and then place a marker or move a marker already in a column. You only get three markers, but you can roll and move until you fail to roll one of the columns you're working in. So pick your numbers carefully and push your luck as far as you dare. Like any play deck game, the production quality is very high and can't stop. The graphics are sharp and the gameplay interface is easy to use. There are lots of animations as the cones kind of dance around. It's cute and well done, but personally I wish you could turn that feature off. What's interesting is Can't Stop is missing some of the usual features you get in a play deck game. There's no tutorial, which is a big no-no to me, but the rules are very simple and they're implemented well. There are two levels of AI that are noticeably different from each other, and the pass and play functionality is basic but works great. Unfortunately, there's no online play, and you can't have more than one game going on at a time. But the app does offer a timed mode in which you basically race to see how quickly you can get three pieces to the top of the board. It's a nice way to play the game solo or if you want to crank out a really quick game. The official port from Playdeck is only available on iOS, but there is a knockoff app on Android that I have not tested. Overall, Can't Stop is a solid implementation of a simple but really addictive board game. The price of 99 cents and sometimes free is definitely worth it if you enjoy playing solo or pass and play games. Give it a try. Hi, I'm Ian from Open Box Games Jr. and welcome to Component Moment. And today we're going to take a look at a game that we have to be real quiet so the wolf doesn't catch us. It's called Hide the Kids. So let's open the box. Hide the Kids comes with strong cardboard furniture. And they almost stand up to anything, even a wolf. Now where are those kids? Ah, aha! Um, We can't win all the time. Hmm, this kid looks like a Jedi. Hmm, this one looks like Mario. And is that Dora? They can't be, right? I just love the components. I mean, it even comes with a puppet. See you next time. Bye!
folks, today I want to talk a little bit about terminology. And, um, and I have a specific ending for this, but when I was a kid, I was called a nerd or a geek. These were interchangeable words. People really didn't care which one they called me. They meant pretty much the same thing. As I've got older, most people like me and others who were called nerds and geeks when we were kids have embraced one of those two words. Not nerd, because that has that whole <laughs> type aspect to it. Geek has the idea of really geeking out over something. But geek still can have negative connotations to it. But we can take a word, we can own it, and that's where board game geek comes from. I was always, I'll tell you, for a while, and I'm still not, you know, when someone says, what's a great website to go to about board games, I'm like, board game geek. <laughs> and it just, I don't know, it just, I, I didn't really, I never really liked the word geek that much. Sure, I'm a geek, but I'd rather describe myself as a gamer or a father or a husband or something, you know, something like that. But that's okay. Well, there's been terms thrown around about board games. And war games is a game about war. Abstract strategy games. And one of these days, I'm going to sit down and talk about categories of games. But one of the big debates and the things is the Euro games versus what many people call Ameritrash. Now, Ameritrash started, I don't know, six or seven years ago. Somebody used that word. Prior to that, Ameritrash was used to describe all the garbagey roll and move games. But someone just started describing it about games where you basically just beat up on your opponents, games where you had troops and fought each other, rolled dice. The theme was very strong. So I never really was a big fan of the word Ameritrash because to somebody who's new to the genre, Ameritrash just sounds terrible. Well, a couple months ago, in one of our top 10 lists, Z changed it to Ameritrash. I thought that was wonderful because I love the thrash people in these games. So we started using Ameritrash. Well, lo and behold, this sparked lots of controversy because I declared we will be using Ameritrash from henceforth. Now, a couple notes on that. I meant I will be using it. Maybe Z and Sam will be using it. You don't have to. You could call these games great googly loogly games for all I care. It doesn't really matter. I just like to have my terminology there. Now, if I'm talking to a new person, I wouldn't say Amerithrash to them. But at the same time, I wouldn't say European to them. I wouldn't say anything other than this is a fun game. And you say, well, how are they supposed to know what kind of game it is? These terms are for gamers. When I say a Amerithrash on my show, the folks who are watching it are mostly gamers, so they know what I'm talking about. Um, if when I say that to a new person, they're not going to know. You say, well, how do you know what their likes and dislikes are? Well, I kind of try to find out. I say, what do you want to do? We can play this. It's a cooperative game where we're all working together. This game here, Puerto Rico or, or Shipyard, which I wouldn't ever recommend to a new person, but maybe this Carson City. In this game, I would talk about the theme. I always talk about the theme first to everybody. The mechanisms come second when you're explaining a game to a new person. But I talk about how it's fun. I don't say, well, this is a deck builder when I'm talking about Dominion. No, I just say this is a game where you're going to build a deck. I describe the game rather than throw out this terminology. But even though I wouldn't use this terminology with new folks, for us gamers, and that's again, many people watch the show, I like to use the terminology. I like to say deck builder in this. And I have to be cognizant of the fact that not all my listeners and viewers know what all these terms mean. But at the same time, I like to use terms that are fun for me. Ameritrash was never fun for me, especially since there was a segment of the, of the internet who took that term and turned it into something mean and ugly and attacked people who liked other games, were just trashy and vile. And I never wanted to be part of that group. They were, they were, they were like the epitome of, of internet trollishness. But I think the Ameritrash name is what I always thought of these games, where people chucking dice and rolling and laughing and having a good time. And there are many people, I should say, who use the word Ameritrash, who do want to chuck dice and have a good time and stuff. But I think Ameritrash is just a little bit more fitting. But it's not a big deal. Maybe you think it is. I don't care. I guess it was a big enough deal for me to talk about it this week. But if you heard us say it, we're not making a mistake. We're saying it because it's fun to thrash your opponents. Hey, it's the captain. Welcome back to Carry On, my four-part mini-series discussing gaming on the go. Last time we looked at some great portable games, but this time let's look at some ultra-portable games for those times when you just don't have as much room. <laughs> my first recommendation is by Steve Jackson Games, Ogre. No, not that one. The pocket size edition is the right size and the right price for any board game traveler. 
In this teeny tiny two player tactical game, your infantry and armor will be pitted against the terrifying cybernetic ogre. Now, at that price, you've got nothing to lose. Give it a shot. My next recommendation is LCR by George and Company. Not much bigger than a felt tip marker, this is easy to put in your pocket. Really not much more than passing chips and rolling dice. If you get bored with it, instead of chips, try using dollar bills. And my last ultra portable recommendation is AEG's ultra popular and ultra portable love letter. Not the best at two players, I would go with three or four. Now I'm very comfortable in my masculinity, but if you can't take the velvety red bag and these cute little tokens of affection, try Lost Legacy by AEG instead. That's it for now, but join me next time as I look at simple solutions for some sandy situations. Until then, carry on. Thanks, Captain, and that's it. Now, I said I have a lot of stuff to put out this week, and I do, but I might take some of today off. Just one day uh, for my birthday. I don't know. I, there's all that. There's all you can eat shrimp at Red Lobster. It sounds good. Anyhow, folks, I really appreciate you guys watching. Uh, we're getting close to a year of the board game breakfast, and the comments have gone from people hating on the show, which they did the first couple uh, episodes, to some of you like it now. So I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you guys for watching. I'm so excited. See you next week. Well, actually, I'll see you in a day or two. I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.